Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I have my tablet, which I bought from John Lewis, actually. It's great. I, um, I ordered it... <laughs> I ordered, it at, I ordered it at 7 o'clock one evening, and it was delivered to me at 9 o'clock the next morning. You can't beat that, can you? Um, I've also got a paper version in case this doesn't work. Um, I'm a researcher, and I would like to just know about the audience here. Um, I can just about see you. I don't know if we can have... Can we have a little bit more light? Oh, there you are. Um, how many of you are teachers? Wow. I'd say that's about 95%, wouldn't you, Seb? Yeah, round about that. He likes numbers, Seb. Um, and how many of you are actually um, yourself using a tablet personally at home or whatever? Hmm, more or less the same, I think. What do you think, Seb? 80%, 85%? Yeah. And how many of you are actually using tablets um, for teaching yourself? You're using your own tablet um, in your teaching. Okay. And can you keep your hands up or put your hands up if you're in a school that's actually using one-to-one -one tablets throughout the school? Uh -huh. So I would say that's about 2%. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's an interesting finding for us. Um, because, of course, a lot of the research schools um, that we've been working with are here today. So thank you very much indeed, all of you, for taking part. It's no easy thing, I know, to have to um, fill in questionnaires, have our researchers crawling all over your school, um, in your classrooms, ob observing lessons. And you've been fantastic, all of you, who have taken part. And I know that there are some additional schools as well who are going to be taking part in our, in our current research. Um, so... Very good to see you. We've been working on this research for two years. Um, the third stage of the research has just been published, and you can download it on the um, Tablets for Schools website. Um, as uh, Andrew said in my introduction, thank you for that, Andrew, um, I have been a researcher for a very long time, and um, the use of technology and children's engagement with technology is something that I've been absolutely fascinated um, by for a very long time. Many of you who um, have taken part in um, our research know my background. You know that um, I've done a lot of research with children, ethnography, looking at the way in which um, young children, particularly early adolescents, uh, engage with social media and the way in which they communicate with each other. Um, but when we embarked on this um, research some time ago, um, I sort of thought, actually, this is quite interesting. Um, this is a new thing. Two years ago, tablets were very, very new. But we were told by many, many people, um, very experienced people, experienced educators, experienced in technology, that nothing was new. This wasn't a new thing. Tablets were, yes, they were new, but this was nothing new. It's all been done before. Um, and they gave us lots of examples, of course, um, including computer suites in schools, um, interactive whiteboards that um, Andrew spoke about, and, of course, netbooks and notebooks that have been introduced to school at all, uh, uh, as well. And, of course, it was so right that they pointed that out. Um, because there's always going to be an argument about children and technology and education. They go hand in hand. And there's always going to be controversy and there are always going to be headlines. And I think that we probably have um, attracted some of those headlines um, even doing this, this project. Now, before, as Andrew said, before I set up um, Family, Kids and Youth, I was um, a social researcher and I worked for a very large company um, called NOP. At the time, it was the largest research company in the world and I was the director of um, social and family research. Um, it's now called GFK NOP. It's changed its name like all companies do. Um, and at that time, um, we launched something. We were very conscious that children were beginning to use um, the internet. This was quite a big story at the time. And I remember the first bit of research we did showed that 32% of children were using the internet. And this was actually quite a big story. Um, and we set up something called KidsNet. And KidsNet um, was measuring how many, children, uh, how many children were actually using the internet and what they were doing it on it, and we were interviewing 2,000 children every six months, so a very substantial sample of seven to 16-year-olds. And I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is a headline, um, New Kids on the Net. Now, this, these sort of headlines we're reading every day, aren't we? But I thought you'd be interested in that, to know that this was actually from The Guardian 
1999, 14 years ago, some of the children that we're interviewing right now for Tablets for Schools weren't even born. And some of their parents were probably the people we were, the children we were interviewing. Some of, many of the teachers would have still been at school. This one, again, net dangers for children. How many times do we read that? All the time. But once again, this was a headline written about our um, KidsNet research in, um, by the BBC in 2000. So the point I suppose I'm making is that, of course, Tablets for Schools is not reinventing the wheel. It's all been done before, but it, we're doing this in a different context. Um, we're no longer, of course, KidsNet research is no longer running, but we do have the Ofcom um, Children's Media Study, and some of you I know were here, um, were at the, like me, at the launch of um, the study, that the most recent findings two weeks ago. And it's very interesting, some of the findings, um, whilst there's been a decline in children's use of mobile phones, use of tablets amongst 5 to 15-year-olds has trebled in the last year. Around 26% of children, so nearly a quarter, over a quarter, aged 12 to 15, own their own tablet computer. And amongst 8 to 11-year-olds, this is 18%, so one in five 8 to 11-year-olds owning their own tablet computer. However, you will note um, that, of course, that's not all children. There are still 26... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there are still... Um, three quarters of all those children who are, don't own their own tablet devices. And indeed, we know, of course, that there are many, many households where lots and lots of tab, uh, internet-enabled devices just don't exist. You know, we don't live in a world where every child has lots of devices. That's actually just a, quite a small minority. So... I think one of the interesting things is to look at what the focus is. And, and actually, Seb and Andrew um, touched on this very much. It's about the democratisation of education, ensuring that those 74% of children that don't have their own tablet, or indeed any other um, device that enables them to um, access the internet of their own, they have to share with their big sister or brother, that they can have equal access to the best content, the best course material, the best education and be creative in their quest for knowledge and learning. It's also about um, the personalisation of education, um, which can be achieved by enabling teachers to adapt coursework um, for children to learn, and to learn in different environments, not just in the classroom, um, for school as well. And this includes gifted and talented children, as well as CCN children. And also, I think we need to remember that we're teaching pupils for the 21st century. Um, using technology um, for them to uh, be able to work in the future when they leave school. Now, we also know, of course, that this is happening globally, <clears throat> and it's this notion of the best of the best, the best content, the best material. And um, so organisations like the Khan Academy in the US and MOOCs, um, massive op open online courses, um, are really giving everybody, if you like, access to masses of education. Now, Family and Kids and Youth was asked um, to look at the notion of tablets in schools um, two years ago, as I said. And we thought, like all good researchers, we ought to see what was out there, what was happening. And it was quite interesting. Globally, and we were quite amazed to find this, there were many, 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 and Seb, I think, um, referred to this, many, many uh, projects going on around the world. And as you can imagine, we keep updating this, and as tablets are getting cheaper and cheaper, more governments are actually using tablets um, for education. So many of these are government funded, some aren't, um, and there are various aspects um, that we're looking at, and I know Colleen's going to be picking up some of the international work um, that's being done on this later. Um, now, I think that we um, need to think about this global picture um, and think about what's happening in the UK. So two years ago, we had a look to see um, what was happening in the UK. And we discovered three schools. Um, Honeywood School in Essex, um, Longfield Academy in Kent, and Wallace High School in Northern Ireland. I'm pleased to say that they're still speaking to us because we have been crawling all over their schools for the last two years. And indeed, they're here today and uh, they're running workshops this afternoon. So thank you to all of you, um, because you've been amazing. Um, and we've learned a huge amount from these three schools. The first um, research report was published in 2012. All of this is downloadable from the website, by the way. 
Um, we moved on and we extended it because we were very, we were uh, conscious, we were very, very iPad um, focused. But of course, two years ago, actually, that was more or less the only choice. But we found Cramlington Learning Village, who are also here today, um, up in Northumberland, who were using Samsung tablets, again, one to one. <coughs> Um, and we also um, found another two schools, Easter Academy um, up in Bolton and um, uh, UCL, <coughs> a brand new school down in London um, that were, had adopted iPads. We also thought it would be a very good idea and our partners supported us um, by giving schools um, tablets. So thank you to Acer and um, to Samsung and to Sony and to Microsoft also for supplying some of the schools with that. And we learnt an awful lot from those schools where we were putting tablets in. Um, in fact, we probably almost learnt more from them from, than from the schools that had already um, had tablets themselves. Um, we, it goes on, it gets bigger and bigger. I'm not going to reel off all the names of the schools, but um, we've now our most latest research um, has covered 21 schools. There are case studies of each of these schools. We've been into the schools, we've, we've observed lessons, we've talked to the head teachers, we've sent um, questionnaires. And um, those studies, uh, that research has just been published on the website, so you can find out about that and you can look at the case studies, which you learn an awful lot from. Um, the characteristics of the schools are quite different. There is, by no means, um, are they all the same. Um, we have three schools that have between 44 and 55% of um, English as a second language amongst pupils, and one school has 78% of pupils um, as English as a second language. The af average, uh, by the way, is 13.8%. And they have a higher number of um, students el eligible for free school meals. So we're not talking about wildly sort of middle class um, schools by any means at all. Um, lots of detail, lots of information. We believe it's the largest and most comprehensive research that's been done. We're very fortunate to have a pedagogy group keeping us on the straight and narrow. And they're there to um, critique our research and to make suggestions as well. And they really are experts in the field. So Professor David Buckingham, you'll be hearing from later. And many of you will know his work. He was at the Institute of Education, um, ran the London Knowledge uh, Lab, and has um, published widely on this whole area of children and technology. Um, Professor Colleen McLaughlin um, at Cambridge, and now she's at Sussex University, and she has done a lot of work on children's well-being particularly, and has look, looked at international um, children and education, particularly in Africa. Um, and she's also done a lot of work on bullying as well. Um, we also have um, Duncan, who is um, Duncan Mackerel from the University of Sussex, who's done a lot of work himself on music and tablets, very interesting work. And we have three also wonderful head teachers, Anne Davis from Longfield, uh, Mark Everett from Rivington um, School near Bath, and Simon Mason from Honeywood, all three schools using one-to-one -one tablets. And they meet, we meet once a term, um, and they give us quite a tough time, um, but it's very, very beneficial for us, um, and they make suggestions about what new research we can do, but they also help us interpret the research. So thank you to them. We're still going. We're now at 40 schools, um, and as you can see, we've got lots and lots of stars there all over the country. These schools include the new Nexus schools, which are going to be, um, have been, uh, Google have given schools um, Nexus tablets, and again, we're going to be following this journey. And very excitedly, we um, are now including primary schools for the first time, which we've always wanted to do, but it was kind of too difficult, really. And now we're going to do um, that. So just to summarise some of the findings, I mean, the first thing that we're always asked is why one-to-one? -one? Um, and I have to say it's not about the device, but it's about um, all the schools have told us that it's about a shift in pedagogy. So it's not, about, it's not even about tablets, actually, but it's about allowing children to um, self-led learning, if you like. Um, it is about one-to-one, -one. I have to emphasise that. We know there are hundreds of schools out there, and probably many of you in schools um, are already using tablets, but you don't have them one-to-one. -one. And it is about, as we said, it's about those 74% of children who don't have access to their own tablet device. So it's about democratisation. And equally, lots of the schools are looking at um, bring your own device, um, BYOD. And um, again, many of the schools that we've been talking to in the research have rejected that because they want 
want children to have the same device. Um, obviously, if they all brought their own device in, there would be quite um, a difference um, in type of device. Um, we, we, you will learn from the, the workshops this afternoon and, the, and this morning that many of the, um, the shift in pedago pedagogy is quite extreme. So many of the um, teachers talk about pupils as learners and teachers as facilitators. So there's a whole kind of shift in the way things are happening with, with learning and teaching. Um, 20 of the 21 schools gave teaching pupils to live in the 21st century as the main reason for introducing tablets. But I have to say that our early adopter schools, which we're calling them, because of course they were, there weren't very many of them, there aren't very many of them, um, really are quite unique. They have, all of them, very strong leadership. They're risk takers and they're they're, they are prepared to jump into the unknown. And we're conscious, of course, that not all schools can do that for various reasons. Um, and I think that um, we therefore um, know that lots of schools need much, much more support, and, and that's one of the objectives, I think, of Tablets for Schools. Um, just a few quotes there that I'm going to let you read. And those are from schools that are actually using one-to-one -one tablets. So we've talked to parents to teachers and to pupils. We've carried out focus groups. We've done a lot of ethnography where we've sat in classes just watching and seeing what's actually going on um, with these tablets. And of course, there has been a change to pedagogy. Um, children are beginning to find out for themselves um, and beginning to learn for themselves, and they really seem to be enjoying that as well. There's also noticeably a lot of collaboration going on, both between pupil-pupil, pupil-teacher, and also pupil-parent and parent-teacher. So there's this kind of dialogue going on, the schools tell us, that didn't happen before, which I think is, is really very impressive indeed. There's also, believe it or not, children tell us that they like to continue work. They can take their tablet and they can carry on working on the bus um, at weekends and evening and in the, in the holidays. And they say it makes life easier for them because they can actually access material in a way that they couldn't before. There's also a sense that teachers can give pupils individual attention so they can look at individual children and check what's going on in a way that is much easier and, more, and facilitated by using the tablet. And in that, of course, they can also monitor progress. So the children, they're no longer teaching in the middle. And, and Davis sort of, I remember saying this to us quite distinctly, we no longer have to teach in the middle. We can notice those children are actually attaining higher, but also the children that aren't quite catching up. And we can adapt um, the material to, um, to that. Um, a few more quotes there. I like this bottom left one in particular from a child at, um, at Honeywood School. Um, so you'll see that there's some very um, um, positive uh, responses there from children and indeed from teachers and parents who are actually using these tablets. But what makes the introduction successful? Now, I can't emphasise enough, and, and you, you kind of uh, uh, implied this earlier, Andrew, when you were talking about Wi-Fi particularly, but there are other aspects as well. Um, a positive attitude from leadership is absolutely essential. We've come across quite a few schools where um, some members of staff have felt this is a fantastic idea, but without the real kind of push of um, leadership and support of leadership, then it hasn't really worked. Um, and there has to be a sense that it's not just about putting these tablets in. You know, we've come across too many schools that have cupboards full of, of stuff still in their boxes. It hasn't been taken out. So it has, these things have to be adapted to pedagogy as well. Um, involving teachers, pupils and parents right from the beginning is absolutely essential. Informing, training, allowing time to actually play with the device. You know when you first get your new iPad or, or phone, you kind of have to get to use, use it yourself. No one can really teach you. You have to find out for yourself. Um, adopting device champions has been extremely successful by many of the schools. Um, there's advice on practical issues like infrastructure. There is a huge problem with Wi-Fi, of course, and also training those key people. Content, 
Um, that was an issue right at the beginning. Now it isn't because um, uh, teachers have had to actually adapt their own content. So there's use of PDFs, of film, of QR codes. Many schools have QR codes up and the children just put their tablet up and, and there it is, it's all downloaded. Um, I have got a film, I'm just going to briefly show that to you. Um, and these are some children that we've filmed over the last two weeks um, talking about tablets that they're using. They've just been given tablets. techniques of learning and that can be used for with your understanding yeah. with the apps that we've got in school you can learn new things that you haven't known that you can do and you don't know it but you've actually progressed that you just think oh it's just a game you can do your homework and do your work and a lot more quicker you can get your work done quicker if you wanted the laptop to look up something and done work The not the thing that's not great about it is that you can get like a, quite distracted with it by games and wanting to go on something else instead of just doing your work. I think we all are responsible enough, but we're kind of addicted. Mm -hmm. I think because we have technology so much in our lives, we can't really um, say, "Oh my God, I don't play games." But sometimes it distracts us, which sometimes gets annoying. We're, like so tempted to open it. Yeah, you're not allowed. Yeah, we're not allowed. I do think that the create for creating an account is just way too easy. Like I made one when I was like seven or something. So, and I, it was so easy. I just put my name, said I was over thirteen, because I and because I didn't know like all that stuff. And then, um, and then I had an account. Um, there are benefits, of course, for pupils, teachers, parents. Um, Pupil engagement has gone up incredibly and cost benefits as well and we really detail that in the, in the research report so it's worth looking at that. There are concerns as you saw from those, cho uh, from those children. Um, so we're not saying it's all wonderful and I think this is something that has to be adapted within the schools if they're going to um, uh, employ tablets. Um, children have to learn reliable sources of learning. They, can't, they have to learn not just to go on and find anything or download from Wikipedia. Um, time management is very important, Both, I think we all find that. Um, the well-being of teachers, I think we have to question slightly because we are finding teachers are actually literally communicating with the kids, which is great for the kids, but all day, all night, weekends, holidays. So I think we need to sort of think about boundaries. And there is the, the little thing about distraction as well. We asked children um, what they would do, um, how they would design um, a, a tablet for school and it's very interesting just to quick look quickly look at their responses you'll see that they're actually saying they want some sort of restrictions for use um, on on the tablets that they don't want to have the distraction of playing and we also asked a child quite recently, she was 10-year-old Anna, I want to show you this, because it actually sums up, in fact, I could have just shown you this one slide, it sums up our research very well. You'll see that she puts the good things at the top and the bad things at the bottom, and we said, what would it be like if you didn't have your tablet? And I think that's quite revealing, you know, she's 12. We can have a long debate about the better health bit. Um, obviously, there's not time now. So finally, just to sum up, for one-to-one -one tablets to succeed, leadership, incredibly important. Um, appoint members of staff as acting as device champions. Introduce professional development within the school right at the beginning. Have regular and collaborative exchange of ideas within the school and also with other schools as well. And actually, that is beginning to happen now with our research schools. And that exchange of advice, um, and hopefully tablets for schools might be able to do that as well and help some of these schools. Thank you very much indeed.